My name is Christopher Balfour. I had hoped to take over the family company. Before the war, we ran our air surfaces along the south coast. And then after the war, we had produced a prototype of this lovely little airplane called the Aerocar, for which we had 300 orders. So how come you didn't take the business over? Well, problems poured our way after the 1945 general election. The Labour government introduced the Civil Aviation Act 1946, which said that if you ran an airline, you went to prison for two years. You could do absolutely nothing about it. You were stuck. Um, We were all ready to start. We had the planes. We had the people. We had the routes. We had the aerodromes. My father constantly wrote to the minister, uh, are you going to start a nationalized airline? If not, can we? The answer was no. We don't want to do it, but nor can you. Impossible situation. So you you had a fleet of aircraft at this point, did you? Yeah, what, what, which aircraft were they? Well, before the war, we had, um, first of all, started off Western Wessex, produced at the Oville. Then we had a fleet of airspeed couriers. Um, after the war, we had had two Dragon Rapides. We had got our orders in for Bristol Wayfarers, hence my interest in Bristol's. And um, these would have been delivered uh, towards the end of 1946, 1947. And um, there was going to be a partnership with the Southern Railway who were going to help paying for them. There was a possibility that in the interim, uh, we would use reconditioned Junkers, German airliners, bombers, which were plentiful and very cheap, subsidized by the government. So all was ready. There seemed to be no problems, but the Labour government absolutely refused to to sanction this. Um, There was no method of appeal. I've written about it in my own memoir, Learning from Difference, and also now on this small book, which a Portsmouth publisher wanted to um, produce uh, um, uh, because there's increasing interest in this aeroplane. And um, yeah, they thought that I should write it was I was still alive. Then now, I've now, now uh, you know, having been thwarted by the Labour government, 1946, what did you then decide to do? So I don't imagine that your family of the sort that would just... Um, uh, politely walk out the door and go away? Went to India. The Maharaja of Jamnagar agreed, we have all the documents, to put a million pounds into the company and support the building of a factory at Port Sika, which is near Jamnagar, um, uh, now Gujarat on the west coast. So th- this would have been newly independent India? At that stage, um, there was no agreement on independence dates. Um, it was thought to be two years away, and there would be plenty of time to get this all going. Mountbatten then arrived and shortened the process and and brought forward independence with disastrous deaths and consequences by a year as part, as described in this book, as part of this uh, disastrous happening, um, the government of India took all the Maharaja, he was called the Jam Sahib's money away, and he very, very sadly had to decide um, that he could no longer support the project. So you were thwarted a second time? Absolutely. What happened then? Well, meanwhile, in England, they were absolutely desperate because they were dependent on all this to get going. They were struggling and fighting um, with government restrictions and everything else. And um, whilst my father was away, uh, they decided to 
sort of take another route, uh, which started off by building bus bodies, some of them on Bristol chassis, and then went on to do any job they could thought. They so could where, think where, where was the family business based? Portsmouth. And did, you, airport. did you get anywhere with um, building buses and that sort of thing? Oh, yes, it, did. it all went very well. Uh, but for all sorts of complicated reasons, there wasn't really a, a place for my father, even though he was the founder. And those who had provided money for um, uh, the company, whilst all this was going on, the results of Mount Batten, um, by that time had more shares than my father. And so, in fact, he was voted off the board. Yeah, so you elbow, elbowed out, as so often uh, happens. If you like, but in yeah. fact, it was all quite friendly. And he decided to start up a small firm um, constructing hardware and other things entirely on his own, uh, which then proceeded for the next 20 years until he died and was a sort of modest success story, but not doing the aviation he liked so much. And meanwhile, those who had sort of taken over and borne all responsibility when he was away, in fact, his first employee, Dudley Escott, they did extremely well despite all sorts of difficulties and um, they uh, um, have now, it's nearly eight years old now, the company, and is now really very successful doing all sorts of aeronautical work. Okay, so what, what's that company now? It's, it's still called Ports Aviation. It's still the same company as started by my father, Ports Aviation. And I'm very pleased to have just had a, um, a note from the grandson um, saying he's so pleased to have the copy of the my era car book which I just produced and he realizes that he is only in his present position because of all my father did. Okay, so look tell us about this aero car because I know you subtitled the book a a Portsmouth venture embraced by an Indian Maharaja. So exactly. how did that aero car come about? This was this was the plan which which they were wanted to produce in England, and then um, got the money to produce it in, in, in India. The, the, the name Aerocar confuses it with some of the later attempts to produce a plane which both um, flew and went on the road. Uh, this was not an attempt to do that in any way. As explained in my book, um, my father concocted the name Aerocar because it was meant to be as easy to get into and as easy to handle on the ground, not as a car, but simply because very cleverly the cabin was very close to the ground with large doors. Um, all the structure was strength was in the wings and the tail planes, as you can see from the photographs. And so it had four large cabin doors and an opening tail, just like a state car or an SUV. And you could use it all sorts of reasons. Um, they'd experiment with the prototype. It could be a small ambulance. It could take, they had tried it with a, a, a motorcycle dispatch rider. Um, it could take it, uh, machine tools, passengers, um, all sorts of things, which is why there was this really enormous demand. And um, you know, all over the world, people realized it was an extremely good aeroplane. And it was this aeroplane, which I know because I've talked to the designer, which encouraged 10 years, 15 years later, the production of the Islander, which is a similar in some respects, aeroplane produced by Britain Norman in the Isle of Wight, which is still in production today, um, having made well over a thousand examples. And um, if, if you sort of follow it, Britain Norman Islander, you can see the story of this aeroplane. So, did, did you ever fly in one of these aero cars yourself? I begged and begged and begged my father, but he said no. Was that because it was a sort of prototype or something? I suppose so. 
I, I don't know. I, I still enormously regret that he didn't. Well, what do you make of what's happened to the British aviation industry? Because it's not just down to the Labour government. Uh, they, there was British Aircraft Corporation incorporated people like Hawker Siddeley, the Bristol Aircraft Company. All these major uh, constructors were, were still making uh, aeroplanes, Vickers, etc., into the 1960s and 70s. What, what, why are we now in the situation where really I don't think there's anybody really making aircraft in the UK now? Well, parts of Airbus. Yeah, but it's not actually a British you know, company, is it? It's over in Toulouse, and actually they're talking about pulling out of the UK. Well, many, many books have been written about this. Look for Corelli Barnett's books, for instance, a lovely series of what happened after the war. It's similar to what's happened in the car industry. Um, after I realized I couldn't work in the family company, I um, actually went and worked on production lines in Coventry and after a bit um, decided to join the employment services, which I worked in for the rest of my life until I became a counsellor. And so many people have written about this. I think too many different types. Um, instead of concentrating on um, one or two and rarely getting them right... Well, I mean, surely that was what the uh, government was trying to do in the in the 1950s and 1960s was to say, right, well, we're going to get just have these kind of government commissions for specific types of aircraft that we know are going to sell and not have, you know, sort of, you know, 10 or 20 different designers designing different aircraft. But there were still too many. And if you read again what people have written, um, you know, you, you've got the famous thing of, of, of the Brabazon and the Princess flying boat, the Brabazon there with you at Bristol. It wasn't really realistic when when you saw what what was happening in America. America seemed to know what they wanted. And when you came to Britannia, there were problems again, Bristol, Britannia, the well-known problems, which delayed that. So I think it was three or four years late. The only real success story was the Vickers Viscount, which was a small airliner which sold extremely well. But then you had, um, what were they? There was the, the, the Vickers VC-10, I think Handley Page had one, and then you come to the Comet, and again, this extraordinary business that the designers couldn't see the mistake they were making. Um, I, as they worked in the car industry, and I saw all the mistakes they were making there. There's no way that they really concentrated, like the Germans in Volkswagen, to make one simple good product and go on and on and make it, design it properly, make it right, and keep the quality up. Um, you know, you could you could find reasons why each of these planes were inadequate in some way or another. And if you read what the politicians, you know that the, the, the politicians like Duncan Sands, they'd never worked in industry. They knew they they simply didn't know um, what they were talking about. It's these wretched public schools that didn't teach people what it was like to work in factories. You had sort of a class system. So you had people at the top with so little idea of industry, um, controlling the budget, the finances, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very, very sad story, which has fascinated me, which is why I've written all these six books. Fascinating. Anyway, look, what about Bristol Cars? Because uh, you did go into the car industry, and Bristol Cars, you wrote that book in 2009, I think, a yeah. very British story. Yeah. So what, what was it about Bristol Cars that made you decide to want to write about it? Because I actually know, having looked at the various books there are on Bristol Cars, that yours really is the definitive one. Yep, um, and indeed has sold extremely well, and is now at one stage it was a thousand pounds a copy. And I mean, first of all, we had contacts with the company. We, we of course, the aviation did work for Bristol's. There had been contacts in the war, um, because in fact, during the war, you know, Port Aviation repaired a lot of airplanes, and there was constant contact with all the airplane repairs. And then in, in 1960. Quite by chance, there was a Bristol for sale for £370. Um, I bought it and literally fell for it. It had sort of handling and feel, which um, 
I've never found another car. They just are a delight to drive. It feels like an extension of your feet, the way you've got the control of the steering and the brakes. and They just are a delight. And as I say, I bought the first one in 1960, and um, then I had another one, and then the third one, which we've still got, which we bought in 1970, and then the other one we've still got, which I really bought for the purpose of the book, which was to learn more um, about what the later ones were like. And of course, this was very interesting because I, I wrote to owners all over the world, and the book has got a chapter of their replies, people writing from New Zealand and people writing from America and Europe and India. And they, I, why the book has gone down quite well, because they actually are a pen picture of why they like the cars so much. I mean, I've just <laughs> driven by several hundred miles in the last few days. I'm off another 200 miles tomorrow. Um, what does the speedometer say? Um, 210,000. Has the car been touched? Nope. So 210,000 miles on the Taco, yeah? Uh, oh, a speedometer, yeah. So why, why is it, do you think, Bristol cars are still going? I mean, it's it's not really like what's happened in most of the car industry, is it? What is it about this motor car? Is it just because it's so expensive? Well, the company, unfortunately, um, George White, who was the son of Stanley White, who did Bristol Airplanes, um, he had this awful accident, and the company was then sold to someone else. And unfortunately, he's now died, so the future is, is, is not known. And um, I'm not sure that there is a place for that sort of car because they have this very much the spirit of driving, whereas it's now about automatic automatic driving cars. And, and um, there's, uh, no Bristol has any much electronics. It's, it's, it's just the, the fascination of driving. And, I mean, why people have struggled to keep them going and why there was interest in the book, it is because there was just nothing like it anywhere in the world. It surely can't compare to today's modern cars, which it's are... It's different. It's different. I mean, as someone that drives it, in what way is it different? Well, you've got very little feel in a modern car. You've got power steering, you've got controls that are all controlled by push buttons, um, I hate the fact you've got to look down to see them. All the Bristol controls have separate shapes of their, their controls, separate buttons, separate switches, so that you don't have to look down. You, you, you keep looking at the road and you can feel you know where they are. The handling of a car, which doesn't have all these power systems, you actually feel the contact with the road. It feels as if, as if um, you're part of it. it, it it's um, you know, as if you were riding a, a horse. You were part of it. In seek a different experience to sitting in uh, a modern car, which is like sort of sitting in an armchair, and the car does all the work. Uh, not all that many people will like them because they don't want driving to be a sort of a physical exercise. But for those that enjoy it, it, it's just that in no way in a modern car do you get this feeling that you're part of the machine. There's one thing that would really sell it to me, Chris, and that is if it's got a, a headlights that you can dip by pressing a switch with your foot. Can you do that? Of course. <laughs> yes, I had a Morris Thousand years ago where you could do that, and I it still one makes me wonder to this day why modern cars don't have that because it's so much easier to dip the switch with your foot than it is obviously to you know when you're trying to drive to steer the, the yep. steering wheel to find the but so you've you've definitely got on a on a Bristol car you've definitely got a a, a thing where you can dip the lights with your foot um, only up to about 1985. Oh no, the later ones had a. a Again, who didn't have to look down. They just had a, a, flick, a flicking switch um, just um, behind the steering wheel. Oh, that is... that is oh, OK, so I'd, if I have a Bristol car, it's going to have to be a pre-1985 one. But that might yeah, cost... if you go and buy one, for God's sake, be careful, because you'll get a bad one. It's awful. So many of them have been driven so far and so hard that unless they've been thoroughly overhauled... Uh, is there, are there good places to get, get a decent mechanic on them? Oh, yes. There are companies, particularly 
Spencer Lane Jones at Warminster, who now almost got monopoly, and there there's a hive of activity. I was there the other day, and the place is just probably 50, 50 Bristol's there. Incredible. Well, Christopher Balfour, thanks very much for joining us. All right. That was Christopher Balfour, whose father ran Portsmouth Aviation in the 1930s, and was also the author of a book on Bristol cars, a very British story, which you won't pick up, I'm afraid, for less than £800 secondhand. You're listening to dialectradio.co.uk, your local community radio run by volunteers. Log on to our website at dialectradio.co.uk to find out more. My name's Jerry Gaston and we're sitting uh, on a hill here at Duck Creek which is just to the west of Pawanui Beach which is a uh, holiday resort town on the Coromandel Peninsula of New Zealand. How do you find yourself here Jerry? Tell me a bit about you. Well I spent 24 years in the Air Force as an engineer then uh, various things, I resigned early and, and took on some other tasks. Um, amongst them I was involved with when Mr Ron Dwen from Dwen M. Out of at Ardmore purchased all the freighters, the Bristol freighters from the RNZF when they retired them. They were all taken to Ardmore with the exception of a couple. So where's that? Ardmore is uh, south of Auckland. Just uh, it's a public airfield on south of Auckland where, where all the GA flying and the warbirds are there and there's a lot of aircraft brokers operate out of there and some engineering firms. Um, they were positioned at, at Ardmore and I was approached and I used to go out there every weekend and give these aeroplanes, he had six of them out of the out of the the Air Force and I used to go out and give them an engine run and just check them over and make sure the tyres were inflated and and eventually um, a group of us got together including Mr Dwen, Ron Dwen and uh, a couple of very capable pilots who are ex-Bristol freighter pilots Frank Roach and Gordon Thompson and we started a little company called Hercules Airlines and we flew Bristol freighters up and down the country. We had two of them. Uh, Ken James was our chief engineer and Ken had never seen a Bristol freighter till he joined Hercules Airlines but he was a very capable engineer and he learnt pretty quick. So what about these aircraft? Why did you decide to use them? Was it just because they happened to be there? Yes, and they were ideally suited for what we were doing. We were carrying a livestock, blood stock, mainly, uh, you know, very expensive horses, and freight overnight. We were flying mushrooms from Christchurch to Auckland um, and any other general freight that we could get. We were the first airline uh, in New Zealand to get an operating licence when the rules and regulations were vastly um, reduced and it enabled us to start this airline up without millions of dollars of backing and all sorts of things you used to have to have before you could start an airline. Because, of course, you've got a problem with roads here in New Zealand. Then, the, uh, you know, actually they're not necessarily reliable. There's a lot of erosion, that sort of thing, and also very windy. A lot of the transport here seems to be dependent on sea or air. Yes, it is. Yes, it is, particularly with the, um, uh, you know... Air, particularly with the uh, urgent and, and freight and, and perishable and Hercules Airlines, we carried things like uh, frozen peas from Nelson to Auckland um, in in insulated containers. And surely that stuff could go by road. Yeah, it could, but it takes too long. They've got <laughs> Cook Strait. They've got to get across the straits. Uh, you know, they've got to get these trucks or trains. The train uh, freight uh, service by rail in New Zealand has greatly diminished. Um, a lot of the uh, provincial railway lines have been closed down, the Napier to Gisborne, for example. Uh, so anything that goes further north on the east coast from Napier to Gisborne has got to go by road. Well, tell us, sorry, uh, tell us about the... Um the particular aircraft, you say it was well suited. What, tell us about this aeroplane. What, what did you like about it? 
Well, it was uh, it was simplicity itself, the aircraft, of course, uh, with the exception of the engines, which were uh, uh, fairly high tech, particularly in the piston engine era. Um, but uh, the aircraft itself, everything was pneumatically operated and uh, air's free, so it could tolerate a leak if you had one. Um, it had no retractable undercarriage, so you didn't have all the complexity of that. It had some shortcomings. The brakes were appalling. A company by the name of SAFE, Straits Air Freight Express, which operated almost exclusively across Cook Strait from Blenheim to Wellington, and uh, they did go further, but that was their main. They uh, put a modification on the aeroplane and put DC-4 hydraulic brakes on, and so they were air pressurised over so it was air over hydraulics and vastly improved the brakes on the aeroplane so uh, but the requirements for when the aircraft were in military service they carried a signaller and in some cases some places a navigator because we went to all sorts of weird and wonderful places but with flying up and down New Zealand we didn't need any of that so they would carry two pilots and that would be it now, one of the unique uh, things about it, or at least there's very few aircraft that look like this, is you could drive two or three cars up inside it and it would just take cars. So I would imagine between the North and South Island, that's an ideal thing to have. Yes, it was. Yes, yes. Uh, it was fairly expensive. I don't know exactly how much it cost, but it was fairly expensive to fly your car across Cook Strait when they had vehicle ferries going by sea. But those who wanted to could put their cars on the... On the uh, and in fact, uh, as in the old days, uh, the seamen used to regularly go on strike around about Christmas, so the ferries would stop. So Safe Air would uh, take over and ferry cars and passengers backwards and forwards. They were a very innovative company, Safe Air, with the with the large nose opening doors. Uh, Safe Air developed a cargon system where they could unload five ton out of the aeroplane and reload five ton have the doors shut the engines running within about five minutes so the turnaround times were were spectacular you'd see them come into blenheim into woodburn and the next thing you know the aeroplane would be taxing out again with another load so they were very efficient these are designed and built in bristol after the war uh, with bristol engines too how come so many ended up here in new zealand the RNZF bought 12 of them uh, as transport aircraft and, and uh, they operated in 41 Squadron predominantly and operated all round our area of influence and interest. We were in the Malaysian emergency, we were in Vietnam, we operated in, out of Singapore. Um, we very rarely flew them much further than that. They'd go up the islands. Fiji and the like uh, in the event of some uh, calamity that needed a bit of uh, assistance. So they were a relatively short range uh, aircraft but um, with the addition of tanks or, or very many stops uh, <laughs> you could go a long way. We, um, I was on the crew that took one to the UK um, for Instone Airlines and uh, they were uh, movers of bloodstock through Europe. They used to use cargo lux. I'm not even sure if Instones are still in operation, but they were at one stage the largest uh, mover of valuable bloodstock in the world. And we bought uh, the rights to use their horse boxes to use on our Bristols back here in New Zealand, and they were very helpful in explaining to us how we should handle this, you know, very volatile livestock. And we learnt very quickly that what Instones didn't know wasn't worth knowing. They were very adept at what they were doing. Now, in aviation, nothing ever goes 100% to plan. Do you have any hiccups with these uh, Bristol freighters? Well, says, uh, no, we, in our operation in New Zealand, we didn't have anything too serious. Um, I can't recall, uh, you know, ever having to... We had a lot of um, interference and a lot of resistance by certain parties within the country. Uh, but as far as the aeroplanes themselves go, they just kept plugging on. They just kept going up and down, making lots of noise. <laughs> They were a particularly noisy aeroplane. Why is that? <laughs> well, 
the engines, of course, were were in the cells there in the in the uh, outer wing or the inner wing, really, in the centre section, and they were pretty close to the fuselage, and there was absolutely no insulation whatsoever. The only thing between you and the outside air at ten thousand feet was a sheet of aluminium. So uh, you know. Did you get the passengers' earplugs? Oh yes, yes. In the early days, uh, the air force used to have hand you out cotton wool because there was no such thing as earplugs in the early days. Uh, l- later on, we we graduated to proper earplugs, you know, the foam earplugs. But but um, us guys that worked on the things and uh, travelled in them extensively, um, half the time we had no ear protection at all, and now we wonder why we're all suffering from deafness. But but uh, that's a product of working on noisy aeroplanes, you know. What, what about um, getting this Bristol freighter back to Bristol? Because uh, there's been a, a kind of hiatus for many years now with the Bristol Aero Collection being stuck in an old hangar at Kemble in Gloucestershire. Now they're in the proper museum up at Filton. Well, how did you get involved in trying to get this uh, freighter back to UK? Well, a gentleman by the name of Bill Morgan approached me uh, by... Uh, he got my contact from somebody and approached me and asked me if I would be of assistance to break this aeroplane down into shippable parts, as it were, and uh, for return to uh, the UK. And I offered my services free of charge because I was really very pleased to see that the aircraft was going to go to a museum you know, particularly one in Bristol where it, uh, you know, originated from. So I said that, uh, you know, I could do that but with, with some assistance. Uh, sadly, the um, the process of them before they finally secured, I guess, the finance and all the necessary approvals and, and planning and all that took oh, two and a half years or thereabouts. And by then I was otherwise engaged in, apart from some very fleeting visits to Ardmore where the aircraft was. Um, I went and identified some spares that Dwayne Emotive had there. They had a huge number of spares for the aeroplane and uh, offered my advice in taking, removing the centre section out of the aircraft. I really had very little to do with it. But I used to pop into Ardmore on occasions and just see how they were going and they did very well. Uh, how did the decision uh, come to pick that particular aircraft because there are quite a few still hanging around here Dwayne Air Motive themselves were their lease on the land at Ardmore they were still occupying World War II uh, what were originally barrack blocks because during World War II Ardmore was a training station they used to fly Corsairs and and Kitty Hawks and things out of there um, and they, their stores department was in these old H blocks, these military style H blocks. They, the lease on the land had ex, was expiring, and they had to move. So Ron Dwyn had long since passed on, and his son Mark was running the company, and they made the decision to close the company down. So the, they had the one and only uh, Bristol freighter left at Ardmore. Um, the others dispersed all around the place. Uh, as I said earlier, one went to Instone Airlines. Uh, a couple of them went to Canada to Transprovincial Airlines. Um, and uh, the others, one one's now down in the Waitomo in the Waikato, and it's at a park-over property type place, and it's used as a unique sort of a motel room. Uh, there's one on the West Peninsula out here by the Manukau Harbour and I think the guy that owns that is just sitting there and it's just slowly but surely decaying. I don't know what his plans or what his use for the aeroplane is. The Air Force have one in their museum down in Wigram which is in very good condition of course. Um, and uh, so the only one left was it was a dear old five nine eleven that would be sitting at Ardmore and slowly but surely uh, depreciating. But uh, fortunately, um, the museum came up in time to to rescue the thing. And they did a deal with Dwayne's of which I, the details I'm not aware of. But but um, and knowing Dwayne's, they wouldn't have given it away. 
<laughs> the the uh, aircraft is a sort of big old lumbering bird. It's not the sort of sleek, streamlined aircraft that we see nowadays. But I know it was actually quite fuel efficient. How on earth? Because it didn't even have a retractable undercarriage. No, no, you could you could um, you can work on about 120 gallons an hour in, in round figures. Um, on the big ferry flights we did, like the one to the UK, that took us 10 days and 96 and a half hours of flying. Um, we carried an extra thousand gallons in the um, in the fuselage in the tank in the fuselage, and we put extra. We put uh, the, it had the ability to put additional oil tanks in the uh, nacelle, another 13 gallons per engine. So which was very fortunate because, you know, the one thing you could... A good Bristol Hercules engine burnt a gallon an hour. A bad one burnt two and a half, three gallons an hour. So on these long 10, 12-hour legs, um, the extra oil was greatly appreciated. But uh, they always said that you could tell a man who'd worked on Bristol freighters uh, because he always had bushy eyebrows to keep the oil out of his eyes. What, what, tell us a bit about the design of the engine, this Hercules. Incredibly noisy, but how did it manage to get a plane through the air without using so much fuel? The It was a sleeve valve design, which was very unique. Um, sleeve valves started way back in the early 1900s in motor cars, uh, but Bristol were really the... To my knowledge, in my opinion, the only people that that perfected the design of the of the sleeve valve itself, which was another sleeve that ran up and down inside the cylinder. There were no, as we know them, poppet valves with push rods and things opening and closing. This thing had the sleeve that rotated uh, backwards and forwards, as it were, as it was going up and down. That rotated actually and opened and closed inlet and exhaust ports um, and uh, so the 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 man that first came up with um, piston engine design old Ricardo he said that the ideal place to put a spark plug in the cylinder was right in the middle well with a poppet valve engine that's impossible to do you can't put it right in the middle because all the valve equipments there but with these sleeve valves there was nothing on the top of the cylinder there were the plug that went in there was called the junk head and it had the perfect spot to put two spark plugs side by side in the in the uh, ideal position to ensure you got perfect combustion and got your money's worth out of the fuel that you put in so that's why they became so efficient and uh you know, these things, the other thing that was amazing about the engine was um, it was 2,040 horsepower, the 735s that we operated. Um, we had some others when we had the Hastings trans long-range transport aircraft when the Air Force had them. They had four Bristol Hercules 733s. So There's only very minor differences in them. <clears throat> but the old uh, 735s, we had a... TBO, a time between overhaul of 2,000 hours, which is almost unheard of in a large uh, 2,000 horsepower uh, radial engine like that, um, without being critical. The 1830 that's in the DC-3, that is a well-known round engine to most people, uh, it was 1,200 horsepower and it had a 1,200-hour life, and if you got the 1,200 hours out of it, you're doing well. In the civil world, when we were operating in Bristol freighters, we were allowed to extend that overhaul life um, after we proved that at 2,000 hours the engine was still perfectly capable of operating. And we ultimately ended up getting 3,000 hours between overhauls. Not They didn't all do that, but some engines would go as far as 3,000 hours, which was, for a big engine like that was absolutely amazing. There is, uh, to my knowledge, there isn't another recip a, a radial engine in the aviation world that had come anywhere near that. What about also the for anyone that uh, knows a bit about engines, the the spark retarder? That was something a bit peculiar about that too. 
Yes, that's interesting. Um, for people that know anything about um, you know internal combustion engine theory, you advance the spark as you advance the RPM to so that you get maximum BMEP, brake mean effective pressure, out of the fuel. Uh, that's going into the engine well in the old freighter the flame front was so efficient uh, that you actually retarded the spark because it because it had less time because the engine was going faster it still built up the same pressure as the engine got faster so they retarded the spark and and that used to absolutely blow people away. They couldn't believe it. It had a thing on the magnetos called an ATD, an automatic timing device that fully advanced the spark to 14 degrees for starting the engine and as you opened the throttle through linkage and this ATV it retarded the spark to 4 degrees so you know for those people who are interested in that sort of thing they'd find it quite interesting I'm sure. Now uh, will any of these aircraft fly again do you think Jerry? Sadly no I don't think so. Um, in the early days of the freighter there were there were some structural problems with them they had some quite serious spar uh, defects which um, in fact one aeroplane in New Zealand that did belong to safe air the wing fell off it in flight Ooh. in Christchurch and sadly the people on board of course were killed um, interesting also um, because the spa life on the thing and the, the life of the aeroplane was actually predicated on the number of landings uh, 44,000 landings and you were supposed to throw the aeroplane away that was in New Zealand here and the reason for that was uh, Bristol themselves after the spa problem and a few other structural problems they came out to New Zealand and they studied the air across Cook Strait between Wellington and Blenheim which is a relatively short and they decreed that the air in there was the most turbulent air anywhere in the world. And so every time a freighter crossed the uh, Cook Strait, it was subjected to this turbulence, and so that affected the So they dictated that these aircraft would have a 25% reduction in the spa life. In Pretty the- unpleasant for the passengers too. What with the noise? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was. Yeah. So they were reduced to 75% uh, of the landings permissible. Uh, when I uh, took the aeroplane to Canada, uh, and I was there involved with Transport Canada, I had a huge problem um, convincing them that we could now extend the remaining life of the aeroplane to, to whatever it should be per se, the 44,000 landings. Uh, and uh, I had to convince them that we were no longer flying over Cook Strait and so you know that New Zealand factor as it was called should be removed off the remaining landing times that the aircraft had and eventually they agreed with me and that was done so but that was an interesting little thing because nobody ever outside of New Zealand ever come across this New Zealand factor before but it's just the fact you know if you can't fly in the wind in New Zealand you can't fly <laughs> it's uh, that simple, you know. We're a long, skinny couple of islands, as it were, uh, north and south, and the wind predominantly is is westerly, um, and uh, the nasty stuff usually comes from the east, you know, the southeast. Can you just sum up in a few words um, what it was like using these aircraft and what they were like to work with? Some of the jobs, some of the tasks on them were pretty onerous. Uh, and some of them, you know, you needed fingers about 19 inches long and quarter of an inch wide. But the um, the experiences that I had in them, and I flew to many interesting places in them, and like Nepal, Cambodia, you know, the trip across to, to the UK, that ferry flight we did, I ended up going via Luxor and, and, you know, I was very fortunate in being able to enjoy that and it was extremely comfortable if you weren't um, doing anything when the flight was on and I used to occasionally, you know, sit in the chair and pretend I was steering the thing, the autopilot did the work mostly. Um you could stretch out in the nose doors and the nose doors had large perspex uh, 
viewing windows in the bottom of them. And you could throw in, we used to carry an old mattress and you'd throw this mattress on the nose doors and lie down there and peer out this perspex and watch the world slowly go by at 100 and, you know, 142 knots. And that was, it was really a great, great time. We had a wonderful time with them. One of the fascinating things that the old freighter had uh, in its military days, it had fuel, aircraft fuel, petrol-powered heaters. They were called fireflies, these little heaters. And they were pretty cantankerous things. And we'd be carrying these poor soldiers somewhere, um, predominantly to Vietnam when I was involved with them. And the firefly heater wouldn't go, so you'd pull out the door winding handle that was there to wind the nose doors open and bash the spark plug with this handle. And all these poor army guys you couldn't believe it, their eyes were hanging out. And um, that you'd get the heater going. And then if you wanted to warm up some tins of baked beans or something, you'd take the exhaust off and hang these tins of baked beans in the exhaust flames. Well, they couldn't believe that you had this raging great fire going on in the in the nose doors of the aeroplane. <laughs> Subsequently, they were taken out, those those heaters, and the hot air off the back of the oil coolers was, was ducted into the cabin to give you some modicum of comfort, but they were pretty inefficient and... They never matched the old firefly, but it was, you know, to have this fuel floating room flame going on inside the fuselage was was something quite different. <laughs> Would they allow anything like that today? Oh, no. Oh, goodness me, no. No, I'm afraid you wouldn't be allowed to do anything like that now, I'm sure. <laughs> no, no, I think those sort of days have gone, <laughs> which is sad in some respects. I mean, we... Um, when I was involved with them in Canada, uh, um, they managed to write one off there uh, in a landing accident, uh, and they were extremely lucky because the aeroplane had two large fuel tanks on it. They were servicing a gold mine up the side of a mountain, and they carried all the fuel in there, and uh, it tore the wings, and the aeroplane went sideways, and it tore the wings off the aeroplane, but fortunately uh, there was no resulting fire, so they, the guys managed to get out of that. They were very lucky. Um, the first one that I took to Canada, uh, um, is, they, is still there to my knowledge, but the one that I took to the UK to Instone Airlines, I subsequently went to the UK and bought it off them and took it down to Lyd, uh, which was the home base of Silver City that used to operate the old Bristols across the channel. And I had old fellas, in the first few days I was there, I had old fellas coming with their log books, tears rolling down their face, busy telling me how they used to fly for Silver City and cross the channel. We subsequently took that aeroplane uh, to Canada across the Atlantic. At one stage, I think we had a ground speed of about 40 knots with the headwind that we had. And uh, then as, when Transprovincial Airlines closed down, the aircraft was sold back to a consortium in the UK and they took it back to the UK. And sadly, the aeroplane got written off on a takeoff uh, accident out of the UK. I um, can't remember exactly which airfield it was. Might have even been Duxford, but but it. Uh, so that was the last flying Bristol freighter in Europe, and uh, to my knowledge, uh, in fact, I'm pretty certain in saying there isn't any anywhere in the world flying now. The South Africans operated them. The Australians had some very early models. They had Mark 21s, ours were Mark 31s. The Canadians, uh, Ward Air, they operated them. The RCAF had them in Germany. They operated Bristol freighters in Germany. So the Pakistanis, of course, uh, they operated a large number of them. And in fact, a lot of those ended up in New Zealand when Safe Air were looking for replacement aircraft. They went to Pakistan and bought quite a few off, off them. So, you know, the 214 that were made were all dotted well around the world. I think uh, Boscombe Down there, the research establishment in Boston, Boscombe Down, I think they even operated a Bristol freighter or two. I'm not sure exactly how many, but they had them too. So, But mostly they were exported out of the UK, except, as I say, for Silver City that operated across from Lyd to, to, to the continent. 
I suppose you, in a way you were sort of playing around. Uh, you could look back on it now, anyway, in the early days of aviation, or, or also, of course, the fact that all the rules were all, would have all been bent uh, after Second World War because people just used, needed the aircraft to get from A to B. Nowadays, the safety is much stricter. Yes, I think that's true too. Yes, no, no, the oversight now uh, on on aviation, even you know, just GA, just general aviation, is is far more intense than it was you know and now organizations have to operate under engineering uh, facilities have to operate under path 145 and everybody's got to have got to have a QA department and they've got to have a safety management system and so on and so forth so yeah no I'm afraid uh, like everything bureaucracy has has claimed uh, a win and in, in the <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, also, of course, it's about passenger safety. No, no wings dropping off, that sort of thing. Yes, well, that's true. That's true. We don't. But uh, you know, if you uh, if you read some of these things, there's there's some sort of incident happens every day, even in this modern day and age around the world. I get a, a communication every day from a, an organisation in in America that uh, categ- uh, categorises and and catalogues any reported incident and and you'd be amazed you know there's brake failures here and smokes in the cockpit and batteries boiling and you know all the you know passengers going mad and opening doors in flight and you know so yeah yeah but I guess we're looking after ourselves you know I hope well that's all for this week Dialects Bristol's first weekly mp3 podcast You can download it to listen on your phone or in the car. Subscribe to our email list and listen the week before broadcast, if you like, at dialectradio.co.uk. Thanks to our guests, Christopher Balfour, whose father ran Portsmouth Aviation in the 1930s and scheduled air services up and down the south coast. They built also this thing called the Aero Car in 1947. He's also author of the best book, on Bristol Cars, called Bristol Cars, a very British story, which goes for no less than £800 second-hand. And also Jerry Gaston, the New Zealander, former Royal New Zealand Air Force, who knows the Bristol freighter better than almost anybody. And he helped get the last one in January 2018 back to the UK, about as far as you can go, I suppose, from New Zealand to here, for the opening of the new Aerospace Bristol Museum in Filton. Thanks also to studio engineers Dave Bazenko and Joss Chivers. Dialects, a Bristol Broadband Co-op production, catch us on Bristol Community FM 93.2 every Tuesday at noon and anyone can contribute. Contact us through the People's Republic of Stokes Croft just off Jamaica Street. They're online at prsc.org.uk. If you have some of your precious time to spare, you can volunteer with us or hundreds of opportunities elsewhere in Britain via the National Volunteering website. That's do-it.org. Thanks for listening to Dialect, and I'm Tony Gosling, wishing you a very good week. I'll be back on Friday with my two-hour BCFM politics show, live from 6 till 8pm. Meanwhile, until next Tuesday midday from the Dialect crew, goodbye for now. Bye.